I hope that the interpretation is working. Thank you so much to all of our dear guests and of course our distinguished speakers for being here today to talk and debate this very important topic. I would like to particularly thank the UEG for their great cooperation, which we have established and have been working out for years now, because this is our fifth webinar, which we are holding together, and it's the fourth in our series about the microbiome, and unfortunately, the last one. It will thus bring our previous uh, sessions to a close and it connects to them and of course you can also take a look at them online the microbiome has a great role in our health and we would like to talk about what this significance can also mean for the world of politics i would like to thank our guests and our speakers for being here today and for taking a look from different perspectives at this topic. I am always surprised and, and full of wonder when I think about the many millions of different bacteria, bacteria that we have in our bodies, and not most of them actually support us. We are not individuals in the sense that we are made up of many different organisms. And only if we maintain this diversity can we strengthen our immune system and our body. And the gut microbiome has a direct influence, not just in our physical health, but our mental health as well. This is a very exciting topic and it's often forgotten, especially if we talk about health policy and would like I would like to now hand over to Patricia Bura from the UEG. It's your turn now. She's a co-chair of UEG. With uh, Salabina, she's been very helpful to our UEG pack, and that is why uh, I'm very pleased that I can start this this webinar with you. Uh, as you anticipated that we had the previous uh, uh, activity with you and it's been very successful during 2020, 2021, when it was Marcus Peck that was chairing the UG PAC. I started at the beginning of this year, the 1st of January. So really a pleasure for me to, to continue this, uh, this activity. And I think that four webinars that have been already uh, uh, proposed by, by, by you together with the UG PAC, we had a quite a, a, a success. So I think uh, um, now um, I would like to present, uh, to give some presentation about my role, uh, which is, uh, uh, as I said, I'm uh, the chair of uh, uh, the uh, UEG Public Affairs Committee. And I would like to show you some slides related what is our aim. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, we are a European uh, uh, society, uh, United European Gastroenterology. But uh, gastroenterology is not uh, just a single uh, society. Gastroenterology means uh, to involve uh, different specialists all around in Europe. And uh, we have uh, what we like to call scientific umbrella organization. Uh, since I will show you uh, so many uh, different uh, societies that are uh, uh, included in, in, in our, under our umbrella with the common aim to improve uh, digestive health. And uh, if we look at the number of specialists that uh, are involved in our activity, there are more than 50,000, which is an amazing uh, number in the field of digestive health. So as I alluded to uh, before, that is the, uh, the, the, the picture of Europe and the, the green uh, dots that tells you uh, how many uh, uh, different national gastroenterology societies are involved so far. We have involved 48 means that any country has its own uh, national gastroenterology society involved. We also have 17 specialist societies, uh, and we are really very proud that uh, we are trying to uh, include all the society with uh, affiliation to EUG, meaning the liver disease, which is all, or the nutrition, the pediatric uh, society. So all the society that uh, have some link uh, uh, even the endoscopy, the surgeons, uh, they have some link uh, with UEG. And uh, uh, that is really uh, uh, united for digestive health. That is our common aim. 
So just to uh, to introduce a little bit uh, the reason why we have organized with Sarah Wiener this uh, uh, webinar today, we would like to uh, um, to diffuse much more what is the meaning of digestive health, which refers to all digestive functions and all the diseases uh, that uh, can uh, uh, include and can affect the gastrointestinal tract, uh, the liver with the biliary system, the pancreas, and that can happen in adults, but also in children. And uh, uh, actually, I will uh, discuss and we will discuss together about the risk of obesity in children, for example, that uh, uh, if it starts in the, in the younger age, then can have a, a negative impact in developing some other diseases in the adulthood. Uh, why we are uh, this uh, uh, common uh, task uh, with with uh, with, uh, uh, with Europe because um, digestive diseases uh, are really uh, very uh, strongly uh, inflicting uh, the the healthcare and the socioeconomic burden throughout Europe, and they often affect patients as I was saying at a younger age. Therefore, it's a cost for the society. Is a loss of economic productivity and, and really it's uh, affecting then within the families when you have uh, uh, any, anyone that can have physical burdens but also some psychological and mental burdens. Uh, why we are so keen uh, with Sarah to uh, discuss uh, on microbiome because actually in the most recent years uh, uh, research has really shown the association of microbiome with, uh, with the digestive health uh, our guts really uh, uh, contain more than 100 trillion of microorganisms. And uh, uh, if we have the proper diversity uh, within these microorganisms, uh, this is uh, uh, a safe, uh, good indicator for a healthy gut. And the, the main uh, relationship that we know is that the diet is the primary determinant of the microbiome composition. And this is why there is a correlation between a healthy uh, gut, meaning uh, uh, healthy food. And this is why we're trying to work in understanding how uh, food relates to digestive symptoms. It's something that we knew since probably 50 years, but now we have this new uh, tool about the study of the microbiome that really can have association, not only for the uh, perception to, 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 to stay well, but also for the a chronic inflammation will show you the mechanism later on and the, the association with chronic uh, uh, diseases, but also with the risk to develop tumors. So the question I think raises why better policies are needed, which is uh, quite clear. Uh, we have a few uh, points, European crisis, Europe is uh, uh, currently failing to manage this increasing burden uh, due to chronic uh, digestive diseases. What about avoidable burden, uh, right? So healthy, balanced, balanced diets and changing lifestyles. We, we know that and we tell everyone, but it's rather difficult to eradicate that into the population, in particular in the category at risk uh, to develop a chronic uh, uh, digestive disease linked to the uh, unbalanced diets. And then uh, uh, surely health oriented food and alcohol policy. This is why we are here. And once more, I thank Sarah uh, to be with us. So the right mix of public health interventions, uh, particularly in the area of prevention and control, can really begin to deliver improved health, what we really wish. And that is why uh, we are uh, proposing this webinar. Uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, uh, follow us on social media links, uh, uh, and you will find all the information. We organize uh, several initiatives, and we uh, dedicate some different times in the year, for example, uh, the, the month of May was dedicated uh, to the prevention of cancer. We have a dedicated day for the cancer was on the 29th of May, and we have some other initiatives always uh, linking with the activity that we have with our uh, colleagues uh, collaboration in, in, in Brussels. So with that, I would like uh, to uh, um, over to uh, Sarah again, if she wants uh, to say something. Otherwise, uh, uh, we can go ahead uh, with, the, uh, with the next presentation. Thank you so much, Patricia. I would like to directly give the word to our next speaker. 
I'd like to introduce uh, Benoit Chassing. He will have the floor in just a second. He has a PhD in microbiomes and he also specializes in the in researching on our gut microbiome. He would wants to find out how it's related to our health. He also particularly addresses the effects of ultra processed food on the gut microbiome, which is a topic which I'm also very much interested in. We've already had the pleasure to welcome him at an earlier webinar as a guest speaker. And today, once again, he will talk about this topic. And I'm particularly pleased to be able to hand or give the floor to Professor Benoit Singh. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So I'm going to share my screen first. There we go. I think you should be able to see my screen now. Yes. Okay. Well, so thank you for giving me the, the opportunity to, to discuss a little bit about uh, what we are doing in, in the lab uh, today. So it's, it's a pretty short talk, so I'm just going to give you an overview of uh, what we are doing and, and where the research is going. Uh, regarding the, the potential effect of uh, ultra processed food on the gut uh, microbiota. So very briefly regarding the microbiota, because I'm sure you are all aware of, of what it is. So it's, it's really the term that we use to define the very complex community of microorganisms that uh, colonizing our gastrointestinal tract. So it's, it's very complex, both in its composition as well as in its uh, quantity. So there is a lot of bacteria, virus, fungi, and they are all very different from, from each other. And what's really fascinating with the gut microbiota is that it can play a, a lot of role in, in our health as well as uh, disease. So it can play a lot of beneficial role, uh, such as, for example, by providing us with a biofortification fortification and, and protecting us against uh, pathogenic bacteria. So it's, it's very important to keep our microbiota in, in check in order to have this, this beneficial role. And if we are not uh, keeping a proper microbiota or if we have alteration, and, and we're going to discuss a little bit about that uh, very soon, you can then turn out to have, uh, you can then start to have the, the detrimental impact of the intestinal microbiota. So this is quite fascinating to me, but this complex community of microorganisms can have such dual role. And regarding the detrimental impact, it can have, uh, it's, they are very, very uh, numerous. So it can, uh, we, we definitively know that the microbiota is involved in the development of uh, chronic inflammatory diseases, such as uh, IBD, inflammatory bowel diseases. We also know that the microbiota is playing a very important role in other uh, inflammatory diseases, uh, or diseases with an inflammatory component, such as obesity, as well as uh, type 2 diabetes. We also know that the microbiota is, is playing a role in, in colorectal cancer, and, and there is some specific bacteria in our gut that can induce mutation and induce DNA damage that will ultimately lead to colorectal cancer. So it's, it's very interesting that this exact same community of microorganisms can be so beneficial in, in, in for some aspects, but also can turn out to be very, very detrimental in uh, select circumstances. So of course, a, what we are doing in the lab and, and what numerous laboratories worldwide are, are doing is trying to understand what is driven this dual aspect of the microbiota and how we can go from a beneficial microbiota to a detrimental one. And of course, diet is, is one of the main factors. So, so diet is, is going to be all the food we ingest that are going to feed and, and to favor the development of those various bacteria. So based on what we are eating, we are going to shape a distinct intestinal microbiota. And uh, so we definitely know that there is some uh, food that we ingest that are, are pretty good for the microbiota that can favor the beneficial impact of the, of the gut microbiota. This is, for example, the case of uh, soluble fiber, uh, inulin, fructooligosaccharides, uh, for example, that uh, are present in numerous fruit and, and vegetables. And there is no doubt that those compounds are highly beneficial for, for the microbiota. There is also the, the dietary polyphen polyphenols, and, and we also know that polyphenols are very important in shaping a beneficial microbiota. What we know also, and, and there is accumulating evidence for that, is that uh, ultra-processed food and, and food that are uh, containing a lot of additives and that are lacking soluble fibers can play a role in shaping more the detrimental impact, the uh, detrimental microbiota with, with detrimental impact for, for its health. So there is a lot of uh, a lot of work currently being done on, on those aspects and especially regarding uh, food additives. And there is numerous food additives that are approved to be used 
by the by the agency. So most of them, as you can see in green, are thickeners and, and stabilizers. There is a lot of, of colorants also and, and dietary emulsifiers. There is obviously all the sweeteners also and, and uh, all of those food additives are, are very important in order to extend shelf life of packaged products as well as to improve texture and, and improve homogeneity. And the work that we initiated, we initiated uh, close, to 20, close to 10 years ago now uh, was really focusing on, on dietary uh, emulsifiers. So dietary emulsifiers, again, as you can see here in, in light green, this is a class of, of food additives that's highly used by the, by the food industry. And uh, we started to focus our initial study on two of them, uh, carboxymethyl cellulose or E4466, uh, as well as polysorbate 80 or E433. And those food additives, uh, dietary emulsifiers, are really, really broadly used and, and highly common in, in processed and ultra-processed food in order to homogenize uh, fat with, uh, with the product. So if you, do, if you remove, for example, the emulsifiers from a peanut butter, you will have this oil uh, separation on, on, top of the, on top of the peanut butter. And, and this is exactly why uh, dietary emulsifiers are highly used uh, by the food industry. And what we observed, and I'm, I'm, I will go pretty brief on, on these initial studies that were published in 2015, uh, we were able to demonstrate that in, in mice model, uh, that uh, when we treated mice model with either CMC or polysorbate 80, which are again two commonly used uh, dietary emulsifiers, we were able to, in, to um, induce more colitis in a colitis mice model. So in, in this model, it's, it's, it's a known mice model to develop colitis, but when we treat the mice with either CMC or P80, we were doubling the, the, the incidence of the colitis. And what's not presented here is that not only there were more colitis observed, but also the, the colitis that we observed were much more severe in the CMC and, and P80 treated animals compared to the control and non-treated animals. So clearly suggesting that consumption of uh, dietary emulsifiers can promote colitis development in uh, genetically susceptible animals. And we did similar approach, but this time using wild type mice. And, and in wild type mice, uh, what we observed was also pretty stri striking with uh, the observation of low grade intestinal inflammation. So those mice, they did not develop colitis, they did not develop uh, chronic inflammatory diseases, but what they developed was more low grade intestinal inflammation that was driving uh, metabolic deregulation. So this is here what's represented here, just an evolution of body weight uh, over time. And you can clearly see that CMC and PAT treated mice are gaining more weight compared to the control untreated uh, animals. And this is clearly linked to the consumption of, of uh, either CMC uh, or PAT. So it's, it's very uh, important because it means that if, even if you do not have any genetical susceptibility, you can uh, still have the detrimental impact of those uh, dietary emulsifiers and, and especially the promotion of metabolic deregulation such as obesity and, and to some level uh, type two diabetes. So regarding the, the mechanism, I'm, I'm not going to go through the, the mechanistic part, but what we were able to demonstrate is that really the microbiota is a direct target of those uh, food additives. And um, you need to have some select microbiota member that are going to detect those food additives and emulsifiers. And in response, they are going to acquire a much more pro-inflammatory state. So you are going to lose some beneficial bacteria, you are going to gain some pro-inflammatory bacteria. And by doing that, you are going to induce chronic intestinal inflammation in, in the gastrointestinal tract that's going to manifest as colitis if you have a genetic susceptibility or metabolic deregulation, obesity, and type 2 diabetes in wild type. Uh, an unfair post. So this was uh, again using only two purified emulsifiers, either uh, CMC or P80. So of course we did some follow-up studies uh, trying to understand a little bit more the, the, the variety of, of those food additives because there is uh, more than 60 that are approved to be used uh, by, the, by the food industry. And, and you can see here this is a, a correlation heat map. So basically what this heat map is saying is that every time you can see a green color, it means that food additives are used in combination. And, and you can see that this is definitely the case for most of the packaged products that are going to contain four, five, or even six dietary emulsifiers in, in combination. So what we wanted to do here was to, uh, to try to understand if, uh, if they are all acting the same or if the, the two that we used initially were uh, very special. So what we did here were, was to use an in vitro microbiota system. So we wanted to stop using a mice model. And, and so we use an in vitro microbiota system that uh, very briefly allow us to cultivate uh, human microbiota uh, in vitro, and that allows us to screen 
some, uh, some food additives. And what we observed here, so basically this is here on, on uh, this biosis index, so basically the higher the, the, the histogram is going, the more disturbed, the more perturbed the macrobiota was. So what you can see is that clearly CMC and PAT were able to reproduce what we observed before, where uh, both CMC and PAT are altering macrobiota composition and, and function in a detrimental way. And what we observed when, when we screen other uh, food additives is that actually most of the compounds are acting similarly to CMC and PAT, but are detrimentally impacting the, the gut macrobiota. Some of them seems to be very, very detrimental, and, and this is the case for carrageenan, and, and that's quite fascinating because there is other evidence suggesting that carrageenan are indeed a pretty bad uh, additives for, for the gut microbiota. And what the pretty good news of this study is, is that if you take a look at uh, mono and diglyceride, for example, as well as, as, well as uh, sunflower lecithin, it seems that those compounds uh, have a minimal or even no impact at all on the microbiota. So most of the dietary mixifera seems to have detrimental impact on, on the microbiota. That's a pretty bad news, but it, it seems that uh, some of them uh, very few of them appear to be uh, very well tolerated by the gut microbiota. So that's, uh, that was uh, the pretty good news of this, uh, of this uh, study. And just very briefly to, to finish about the human relevance. Of course, we are highly interested about the human relevance of, of the findings I, I, I just presented to you. So we just released the first uh, clinical trial focusing on emulsifiers in, in human. And, and this is the first study uh, that's, uh, that's published, but there is other that are, that are ongoing. And this was performed in collaboration with Gary Wu and, and Jim Lewis from the University of Pennsylvania, as, as well as Andrew Gevers from uh, Georgia State University. And what we did here was uh, to have two, group, two groups of, uh, of participants. Uh, one was uh, treated with an additive free diet, so a food that was not containing any type of food additives, while the other group of participants was uh, treated with uh, exactly the same diet, but we were supplementing the diet with uh, carboxymethyl cellulose one of the most commonly used uh, dietary emulsifiers. And very briefly about what we observed uh, regarding macrobiota composition. So this is here what's represented here in this uh, panel. It's uh, macrobiota richness. And we all know, and, and it's now well established, but the higher, the, the rich macrobiota is a good macrobiota. And as soon as you start to lose diversity, this is a, a detrimental impact on, on the gut macrobiota. And what you can see is that uh, even by treating the, those uh, participants with a, a very, during a very short period of time with only one dietary emulsifier, you can see that their microbiota is starting to lose richness uh, by uh, 14 days of, of uh, CMC exposure. So of course, this is uh, really uh, quite fascinating, quite uh, disturbing as well, because it means that just by uh, consuming one emulsifier over such a short period of time, we are starting to have the detrimental impact on the gut microbiota of, of those participants. So what would be the consequences of cocktail of emulsifiers over a month, over years of exposure? This is something we are currently investigating and I hope to have the, the answer uh, relatively soon. So this is, uh, this is also what we observed in, in the studies, but it's definitively seems that not all the participants are impacting the same. And, and this is something we are currently uh, highly uh, studying in the lab. And that it seems that really depending on the microbiota of each individual, so based on the microbiota that's living in our gastrointestinal tract, we are more or less susceptible to dietary emulsifiers. So this is the, the conclusion, uh, uh, conclusion slide where uh, clearly dietary emulsifiers can directly impact select number of our microbiota uh, uh, in a detrimental way that's going to drive uh, chronic intestinal inflammation that can manifest as colitis, but also as a metabolic deregulation, such as obesity. And uh, again, the, the two important messages I wanted to highlight is that not all emulsifiers appear to act the same on the gut microbiota. And also, not every single individual appears to respond the same to a given emulsifier. So, so I think there is definitely space here for some personalized medicine and, and personalized nutrition, in which we can take into account the microbiota composition in order to define uh, the additives that, are, that, are, that, that can be used uh, for, for select, uh, select type of products. And with that being said, I, I just wanted to thank all my collaborators, I was, as well as all my teammates and, and all, all the funding agencies that are supporting the, this, this work. And yeah, I would be really happy to take uh, any question maybe after the, after the second talk during the, the Q&A uh, session. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Shasan. Absolutely very interesting talk. And uh, uh, being a pure gastroenterologist and hepatologist, I found most of uh, uh, your information that are associated with uh, our um, experience. And uh, I think now it's a, 
is a bright time to show uh, to all of you uh, which is really then the link uh, from these abnormalities that we can have uh, by different causes that Professor Shashan showed to us and uh, the, um, the clinical uh, aspect of that. And uh, uh, since uh, uh, Professor Shira Serbezaji uh, cannot attend because she, she is unwell, I will give her presentation instead. Uh, she wanted to talk about alcohol, sugar and obesity and the synergistic effect between these three factors in terms of the impact uh, on, uh, on different diseases. And uh, um, I will uh, report on a plain screen to you. And in particular, liver disease, as I said. Uh, let me start with uh, this recent, this absolutely very recent, it has two dates, because I asked uh, um, this slide to Professor Zoba Yunusi. He was presented last uh, Friday in London at ILC. And uh, it's amazing that the last time we had this uh, uh, prevalence internationally, it was a few years ago, and we were at 25%. So in few years, we moved the global prevalence of NAFOL from 25% to 30%. So instead of improving, despite all we do, um, I'm talking to, to, to Sarah Wiener particularly, that is the global one, but it means that uh, we still have uh, uh, a lot to do because instead of improving, we are getting worse. So this is to start with. Uh, as, um, uh, 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 Shira wanted to say, and we all know that there is definitely a synergistic effect between alcohol consumption and obesity, and that uh, will lead into what we call fatty liver or non-alcoholic fatty hepatitis. Now they, they, they are discussing also in the, the nomenclature, and there is a, a group from Europe and a group from the United States that uh, would like really to call uh, metabolic fatty liver disease. So a disease more complex, which includes the fatty liver includes diabetes, includes hypertension, includes cardiovascular diseases and, and liver disease. Why it is so complex? Why we, we talk about alcohol consumption and, and, and steatosis? Because uh, there are some common uh, uh, process in terms of the evolution of the liver disease. And uh, uh, for the uh, uh, fatty liver, we start with uh, uh, um, the fatty uh, and droplets of fat within the liver which we believe uh, can still be sold with the adequate diets. Uh, but then when we have the progression into steatohepatitis with a chronic inflammation, it is quite critical to have the evolution to observe histological the evolution in fibrosis, having then the, the final cirrhosis. And very similar from the alcohol state, we, we, we can start to bring and to develop a fatty, fatty liver. Then we can have an inflammation with the steatohepatitis, alcoholic steatohepatitis, and again, we don't know when there is a stage where we develop fibrosis. And sometimes uh, uh, we have at least 10, 50% of the people that are already cirrhosing and they don't know. So we have uh, patients around in Europe that have already cirrhosis, either due to steatosis or to uh, alcohol intake, and they don't know that. What is the highest risk to develop hepatocellular carcinoma? This is a complication of the cirrhotic liver. But I can tell you that for the NAFOL, it is a unique condition. You can develop the cancer when you have only the steatosis. You do not have the still the cirrhosis. And you can unfortunately have to tell the, the citizen that they can develop the cancer when they have only the steatosis. So this is why we have to really work a lot on, 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 on telling uh, 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 all European uh, uh, citizens that, that that is the high risk. Sometimes uh, they cannot be distinguished. They have. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, a similar histopathological findings. And that in uh, uh, just to, to try to, uh, to be in line with what uh, uh, Professor Shassan was saying about uh, the laboratory findings, this is our experience uh, that we start with the, uh, some metabolic risk factors, uh, as uh, I mentioned with this, uh, 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 this paper, we're talking about the sexual dysfunction, which is a neglect syndrome, but it's uh, uh, linked to this. And, uh, Let's say that uh, when we develop uh, the uh, um, uh, insulin resistance, this is going to, to go into uh, the increasing risk of obesity. This works for both uh, uh, children and adults. In this paper, they actually show the uh, loop uh, between uh, the NAFOL, uh, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, and then in male, even hypogoradism and, and erectile dysfunction. And this is what is shown uh, in the progression of the, the uh, uh, liver damage with the lipogenesis stimulating 
the normal liver and moving into the steatosis. But then with the second hit, if you have a chronic inflammation with the oxidative stress due to the still presence of fat, triglycerides and other risk factors, as I said, at the end, we will get into fibrosis and cirrhosis. So all this uh, means uh, a metabolic syndrome and the patient will uh, experience some cardiovascular manifestations such as hypertension. He will have uh, some metabolic uh, diseases such as hyperglycemia, hypertriglyceremia, low levels of HDL, then diabetes with central obesity, and that is going to, uh, to further, unfortunately, uh, make worse. Just to show something that it was not from Shira, but more myself, that I'm quite uh, very much involved in liver transplantation, that, that since in the United States, the situation of our obesity of osteoarthrosis is much worse than in Europe, we have to learn the lesson in time. For example, they show uh, that in 2018, uh, the, you see here in red that NASH was the highest, there was the commonest indication for liver transplantation in female population. So we want to stay quite far from that. And, and, and unfortunately, in the United States, they really show that there is uh, that increasing rate uh, that you see in the, in the black uh, 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 line uh, was an increasing registration uh, waiting list for transplant of patients with NASH, which mirror exactly the increasing rate of obesity in the US population and the increasing rate of diabetes. So as I said, since Europe is quite still a little bit far from that, we need to pay attention. We need to intervene in time. In fact, I show you our experience that this is very recent paper that we look at our center in Padua. It is correct that we are seeing an increasing rate of uh, the registration of patients that went illicit for this steatosis. In fact, it was uh, only 2.5% of uh, the, uh, the patients in, 20, in, in, 20, in 26, whereas it's today 23%. Overall, it means 12% that is not the 50% that we have in the States. So we have absolutely to work on this. So coming back to what uh, uh, Shira wanted to show you, uh, there is the association between uh, uh, NAFOLD and within alcohol-related liver disease. And this is due to the uh, uh, behavior risk factors that coexist. And therefore the combination of the two is even worse than having NAFOLD or, or alcohol-related liver disease since it can accelerate the liver damage in a synergistic, in a synergistic way. And that, that the message to, 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 to Sarah Vina is the same. We need to prevent and to work on both. And now I will show the link with the microbiome. So that, that is the link with everything that we really need to work together. This, in fact, as, as I said, there is another study that demonstrate that, that, that confirmed in this cohort of Finnish uh, uh, population that uh, from the population-based survey, they uh, confirmed the association between the metabolic syndrome and the diabetes. And we also know that the diabetes is then associated with the risk of cancer, not only the liver cancer, but the risk of cancer in the, in the population. Here, for example, if we, if we look at the uh, risk for liver disease mortality, uh, you have uh, the drinking status uh, in, uh, in, in this way. So from 0, 1 to 14 and more than 15 units per week. And then you have uh, in this column on the, on the left, you have from the normal weight, the overweight and obese people. And you see how the combination of alcohol and, and obesity makes really the risk amazingly higher. So that is the risk of mortality, nearly 19. So that means that you have the combination of obesity and drinking alcohol more than 15 units per week. That is going to have a 19 higher risk of mortality compared to the breakfast number. And, and, and this is not only, as I said, for the obesity and for drinking for causing related maybe to cardiovascular disease, but also for the development of, uh, of a hepatocellular carcinoma, as I looked to before in the cartoon where I show you the risk to develop a hepatocellular carcinoma in both the people that are drinking uh, alcohol and in people that are developing ST arthrosis. So that is a very high risk increasing with the combination of the two events. Then it's uh, uh, why we should work together, uh, uh, Sarah, because, and all that are connected, because also the behavior can be similar. So it's quite common to see that there, are, uh, there is uh, uh, people that are drinking too much and, if, if, and at the same time they are, they are eating in a, in a bad way. So they are eating too much, they're drinking too much or they are even drinking something that is very much associated with diabetes and obesity, which are uh, uh, drink, uh, they drink soft drinks. And this is uh, a picture that shows how much today we have the ultra-processed products 
it's very nice that this is the link to the uh, to the uh, study, the nice study really that uh, uh, Professor Shasan just showed us about the uh, emulsifiers that we don't think very much about that, about those emulsifiers, but it's uh, probably in most of the, 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 the product that we eat every day. And uh, once more, uh, the ultra processed food consumption. So we move from the data they have in the laboratory to what's happening in the reality, increase the risk of cancer, uh, the risk of cardiovascular disease. And we know that quite well having uh, even up to 75% of patients with uh, uh, obesity and steatosis uh, experiencing some uh, uh, levels of uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, coronary artery disease. And uh, uh, as I said uh, and reported in this uh, uh, paper that I'd like to mention, uh, children and adolescents, every time I speak in this context, since uh, there is, uh, we are observing an increased risk for them to develop uh, obesity. You have to know that uh, there are some recent studies that show that once you develop obesity and you are, uh, you are adolescent, then it becomes more and more difficult uh, to get over of it uh, 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 moving into the adulthood. So you need really to work on kids uh, even earlier in order to avoid to have this uh, irreversible, irreversible progression into the chronic uh, liver disease. And this is why there are some um, other societies that are working uh, on reducing uh, the, the excess consumption of added sugars in particular, as I said before, the, from the uh, sugary drinks, that uh, the kids, they don't know they like it because the taste is very nice, but we have to tell them how much it does correspond when they drink uh, these soft drinks. So just to summarize, uh, these are also the, the ESOL policy statement that was uh, published a couple of years ago about the different uh, certification of policy strategies, uh, uh, pricing, pricing about uh, 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 processed food, uh, ultra processed food and alcohol, then how to manage uh, uh, with the different tests that we have uh, the environment, also to propose the screening uh, for different, uh, in particular population at risk uh, for both the behavioral interviews in order to uh, avoid to have uh, then uh, the screening for the liver disease. So I would like to thank uh, you for your attention and uh, I'm sorry that I needed to present some uh, slides uh, they are not uh, mine, they are from Shira, but I think she will be happy to know that uh, we respect her presentation. And now, as, as uh, Benoit said, we both are really uh, ready for question and answer uh, from, uh, uh, from the online chat system. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if I take the chair with Sarah, I don't- Thank see. you. Okay, Sarah, this, over to you. Yes, I would have a question. Maybe then others will uh, dare to ask questions as well. In the survey of Benoit Chassag, uh, we are talking about emulsifying agents. Uh, are there surveys about other food additives and their effects? And question, why emulsifying agents? So, yeah. At the beginning, we decided to use dietary emulsifiers because they're acting basically like detergents. So we, were, we wanted to look if maybe they are going to erode the mucus layer in, in the intestine. So it was more a, a physical thought that, that we had at, 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 the, at the time. So this is why we initiated work on, on dietary emulsifiers. Uh, I would say that this is, the, I think, the class of additives where there is the most research currently. But it's definitely not the only one. There is a lot of things going on of some sweeteners, artificial sweeteners, and, and also demonstrating a detrimental impact of those food additives on, on the microbiota. There, is, there was one pretty big study that was published last year about uh, food colorant also. And, and there was some data demonstrating that there is some food colorant that can be metabolized by the gut microbiota uh, that will drive to, to some very toxic metabolite that can also drive uh, chronic intestinal inflammation. So, yeah. Emulsifiers is one of them. There is a lot of data on them, but it, it's definitely not the only one. Yeah, if I may add, I was really impressed about uh, the, um, I was not really thinking how many emulsifiers you can have in any, even consider a little bit healthier food. So I think that is a, is a, is a message when you add that we should really give. And uh, once we finish that study, I think that is very important. Uh, uh, in uh, practical in, in, in daily life when we have to recommend the different different foods. So, yeah. 
So I think Sarah, if you want, uh, we can uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Shassan for uh, for his talk. And I think uh, if if you like, we can move to the second part. And uh, uh, and uh, I leave to you. So thank you very much, Benoit. So Sarah, if you want to introduce uh, uh, the first speaker of the second session, uh, that will be very good. Yeah, vielen Dank. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, also, ich freue mich jetzt. Hi. I'm looking forward now to Floriana. introduce Floriana Cimarosti. She is our next speaker, and uh, Floriana is General Secretary of NGO Safe Food Advocacy, and she is a representative of the users in EFTA. In the past, we already had the pleasure to have her in other uh, seminars on microbiomes. Uh, I'm very glad that she found time to join us. She will deal with the role of consumers in the green transformation of our health and food safety. Floriana, you have the floor. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you so much for this invitation. I was very impressed by the presentation. We had before, it's very interesting, um, even the consideration of, uh, of the additive uh, specific, how much damage can do to, to our health, uh, to our body. So I really would like to thank so much the speaker we had uh, today, because I was very, very impressed. Um, so my name is uh, Floriana Cimarussi, I'm Secretary General at SAFE. Uh, I will be glad to, to start my presentation. So um, please, can you go to next slide? Thank you. So actually, first of all, who we are SAFE, it's uh, an independent or profit organization. Uh, we represent the interests of European consumers. So, so actually we try to protect European consumers during the EU food legislation process. Um, our activity, we do lobbying to improve EU food uh, legislation framework, raising public awareness. We try to train consumers to teach consumer what is in their food, how to read food labeling, uh, and will it have a, a European project? Next slide, please. Yes, here there is a short video talking about SAFE very briefly, if you can uh, have the video. If you have an issue to show the video, I think there was some trial before the conference to see if the video works. If you have an issue, we can go ahead to the next slide. <laughs> yes, thank you. So um, an issue we should talk about when we talk about uh, food safety is about food environments. Um, with the Food Coalition, SAFE is board in the organization of the Food Coalition. Uh, together with many other NGO that you find on this uh, on this slide, we work on food environments, and we believe food environments is fundamental. So, what is food environments? Is the physical, economic, political, and sociocultural context in which consumers engage with the food system to make their so their choice about eating the food of the others. In the presentation that was uh, before about Ms. Burra, for instance, it was very interesting to see. Um, the sugar part. So how much sugar we should eat every day, if we eat too much sugar, what could be the health issue we can have, etc. In reality, if you see all information we receive either on, on the internet or in general, uh, you hear very often it sugar is very good for you, give you energy, make you healthy, etc. This is what I talk about food environment. So food environment is even all the social cultural context in which we are in and the information we receive and the way it's done our food environments nowadays in the EU is not healthy enough to, to help consumers to do the right choice. Next slide.
So exposure to aggressive marketing, I think is something we all know. So uh, even according to the 2021 Digital report, proven link between childhood obesity and exposure to HFSS food marketing. Actually, I think you can, do, you can see this everyday life when you go in a supermarket sometime with, with, with small children, you can find food with their favorite hero on the packaging, um, I don't know, Superman, uh, whatever. And the child is like insisting with the parents to have that food. And that's like how marketing is really influencing how children eat. And although parents try to insist to them, but it's the way, again, our food environment is. Um, and there is the online ads per day. If you see only in 2017, an average of children from four to 17 was exposed to 4.7 online uh, ads per day. So the use of cartoons and children-friendly market tactics to make products appealing, as I was uh, explaining to you uh, before. Misleading claims. Yes, this is definitely what's happened to, to us every day. Um, so according to, for instance, to action on sugar on children, over 63% of products tested more than a third of the daily sugar intake. So it's like you buy a fruit yogurt. So in, in theory, the most healthy product you can think of. Why? Even there, there is a lot of sugar, much more than you can, uh, can imagine. And this information is very difficult to give to, to consumers. Um, and then there is this nature, misleading nature uh, of claims. Like very often you find on certain products, nature products, 100% um, uh, natural ingredients or 100% ingredient naturel, as we say in French. But it is always true. Sometimes it is true, sometimes it is not true at all. However, because there is not a legislation to define what is nature, what is not natural products, um, companies are free uh, to use as much as they like uh, the word uh, natural on their, on their packaging. Poor diet, a present is school of a machine with unhealthy food and drinks. Uh, it's a major source of exposure. So there are school were forbidden having like all kind of chocolate snacks or whatever or coke or every kind of drinks uh, during the pause they have they can go and buy other school where this exposure is not possible uh, and there is this increased consumption of high in fat sugar and salt uh, for kids next slide please Is it possible to go next slide? <laughs> Thank you. Um, economic condition, let's say if we are having a big project on, uh, it's called Food for Inclusion, where we realize that depending on the economic situation of, of a family, it is, 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 there is a big impact in the way uh, people with the uh, disadvantage uh, situation um, eat. What I mean is that the impact of AFSS product advertising is not equally distributed on the population with exposure high gain in disadvantaged area. So we realize how much um, uh, tra give training to kids or a teenager who come from disadvantaged area in school uh, really need much more information that kids or teenager or even adults people who uh, grow up in less disadvantaged areas. So the economic situation really influenced the way um, people eat because they don't have the, the, the correct information about it. And um, the consumption patterns are associated with children in low income households, with parents of migrants background who lack social network, single family and unemployed parents. This is, was really clear, we went all over school, for instance, in Belgium, not only in Brussels, train uh, kids and uh, um, even teacher and uh, parents. And we realized how much uh, they were really well informed in certain area and much less uh, in other uh, not disadvantaged area. So next slide. Thank you. Yes, today actually, um, several presentation we're talking about uh, the problem of, of ultra processed food. I don't want to go too much on detail on this slide. This is a very interesting study 
the Molisana study where they clearly show what's the bad influence of eating ultra processed food every day. And there is a clear, um, Yes, and actually it's, it's evident the results indicate that high consumption of ultra processed food is associated with 58% increased risk of CVD mortality and 52% higher risk uh, of dying for several vascular uses. And I was very impressed about this study because we have several studies on ultra processed food, but this one was very detailed. Uh, very well done and was about 8.2 years uh, and followed by 184,816 people. So it's a very, very uh, big study that really explained that eating ultra processed food each day can be uh, very risky. Uh, next slide. Next one. So yes, how we can address this issue? There are awareness raising and, and there is the part of advocacy. Safe is taking care of both of them. Please, next slide. This is an example of all training we give on food literacy training, uh, which is something we, um, we have done in many, many schools. Uh, we teach to children, et cetera. We do several workshops, really trying to give, uh, creating awareness on this issue. Next slide. I'm looking at the time because I'm worried that I'm talking. Uh, maybe it would be good to go faster with the slide if you don't mind, so we can uh, approach. Exactly. So um, how to achieve sustainable food system? This is the big question. Um, so actually, uh, safe support several elements. So um, directive proposal on empowering consumer for the green transition, which is very important a directive proposal. Safe believes that the proposal will not fall short on the following point. So we have to be careful, safe support the following elements, create a better environment for consumers choice by strengthening of the unfair commercial practice directive, ban on unsubstantiated environmental claims, which happen uh, in many food products. Um, and what we would like to change, uh, some environmental claims include words like as nature, as I told you, I think before, that are currently not defini de defined under the initiative. The commission should better define specific claims where the green claim initiative will not apply. Proper understanding of consumer of different definitions, such as sustainable, natural, eco, environmentally friendly, that nowadays are used and are really not, uh, not so clear. Next slide. Yes, uh, how to achieve again, uh, sustainable nutrition is key in the future of people. So labeling, um, able to highlight positive and negative nutrient profiles, able to show the presence of well non toxic and other substances that we have seen before, we could have a type of additive who can be very toxic. For the health, we have seen the whole story of E1117, um, how much it was difficult. And at the end, it went really well to ban it at uh, EU level. Um, it could be mandatory for a member state, uh, but has to improve really the knowledge and the way consumers understand. Again, uh, important nutrient profiles, ban of nutritional claims on HFSS, food and marketing of unhealthy products is very, uh, I will say, um, it can be very irritating sometimes to find food full of sugar, full of fat, full of of a healthy issue for kids, for teenagers, for adults, and then you read, yes, but there is vitamin D, or it's very good because there is calcium or this kind of information. So we should really ban all those kind of nutrition claims on HFSS uh, products because they can be really misleading for certain consumers. Uh, Yes, uh, having graphic tools, for instance, to allow consumers understanding the maximum, lo um, maximum amount of sugar suggested sometimes about sugars written 24 grams, 25 grams, or is it how much proportion for 
This is written, but the calculation of 22 grams of sugar, what does it mean? It's divided by four, how many teaspoons of sugar? Is it too much for me? Is it good? It's to have this kind of information a bit faster and to the point. Um, and of course, it would be good uh, reformulation, reduce the amount of sugar salt there is in a lot of products, food products. Next slide. Thank you. Yes, future action for, from safe reformulation for the agro industry would be good to reduce a sugar. Um, like you find a lot of teaspoon of sugar in the tomato sauce. It's an example. When I was a kid, it was not enough to put all the sugar in the tomato sauce. Create a labeling criteria for consumers. Uh, we at say we do not believe the Nutri-Score is the best option. We definitely think the Nutri-Score can be misleading. Uh, for consumers, a harmonized and intelligible front of back nutrition label, new nutrition profile based on the WHO profile model, aggressive market of high food sugar or salt uh, products. That's something we should really uh, stop. I think it's my last slide. Um, thank you so much for the attention uh, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much to, to you. Thank you very much to Miss uh, uh, Cimarusti. I think we'll, uh, if you can stay, because surely there will be some questions uh, to your, your interesting presentation about uh, uh, SAFE and about your role. And uh, I would like now to invite uh, uh, Dirk Adric from European Commission. Uh, is, uh, uh, Darf ich vielleicht gleich wieder eine Frage stellen? Uh, sorry, maybe before you give the floor to our next speaker, I would like to ask a question. So in this speech, you particularly talked about sugars, but of course there are different types of sugars uh, in fruit, for example, or in cereal. And we're also talking about labeling. So the Nutri-Score, tries to also label the content of sugar. And so my question is, since we're talking about the microbiome, whether sugar uh, is not a problem because uh, maybe they're saying, okay, well, maybe if there's sugar, we can add this additive. So we've got too many um, fats. We can just uh, add emulsifiers and so on. Is that really a solution that we should try to promote or should we maybe not say that we should uh, not add more chemical substances? if we want to reduce the sugar. Okay, thank you. Um, well, the fact that in, there are an enormous amount of chemicals in one food, which let's say uh, coca light, I don't want to, to give a name because I know it is not correct. Let's say um, a product where there are many chemicals, there is sugar, uh, there is salt, or maybe not absolutely in the same products, of course. Then the problem is that with the Nutri-Score, they are giving you the information that if there is a, a high amount of sugar, that food has a low on Nutri-Score. So it cannot be A, B, C, maybe it's D, maybe it's C. However, we cannot have on a products like um, Coca Light, for instance, I'm sorry if I say the brand, but it's full of uh, additives where they give me a B because it's light and there is a lot of, a lot of sugar and they give a DOE on uh, organic oil of olive. There is something in the way the Nutri-Score labeling is used that is not the best way for consumers. If there is a German consumers or a Dutch or um, from Nord uh, country who goes, it doesn't have a lot of time, it's just 10 minutes to, do the, uh, to buy some, some food for their kids and their family. And in this 10 minutes they go there and they get all products for Nutri-Score A and B, I can assure you that a lot of those products are not healthy at all. You can have like uh, frozen uh, fish full of additives with the B because there is not a lot of sugar there and they give you good notes, but it's full of chemicals and there is nothing of so good for your kids to give such, such a products full of chemicals, even there is less sugar, so you can use it. So we have really to be careful about Nutri-Score because Nutri-Score can be really misleading 
for consumers. And I don't think that we should reduce sugar and increase chemicals. This is not at all a safe message. But there are a lot of products on the market with an enormous amount of sugar. We're just reducing the sugar without increasing chemicals. We could still have a better product for, for our consumers, knowing that obesity and all these kind of issues are increasing enormously in the EU. I think, Sarah, we have to thank uh, uh, Floriana and we move on uh, to the next presentation that uh, will be given by Dirk Adrika from the European Commission. Uh, he's a policy and program officer at the European Commission's uh, Directorate General for Research and Innovation. Uh, he's working in the unit dedicated to combating diseases and is really developing funding programs and policies for health research, for personalized medicine and for human microbiome. So he will really give a talk about uh, the microbiome funding and uh, about results, trends and prospects. Yes, hello. 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 hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much to be with us. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity and for organizing this meeting. It's uh, very interesting. And now I wonder if I should share my screen or if you upload the slides, I don't know. You share the screen. I can share my screen. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, I have to select the right screen, share. Scanning something. Okay, all right. The window maybe is... We can see very well. Okay, great. So yeah, my name is Dirk Hartrich. I'm working at the European Commission since more than 20 years now. And I've been working in very different areas, you know, that we are changing from time to time. So currently I'm uh, in the area of health research, uh, trying to combat diseases. In particular, I focus on cancer and mental health. Yeah, we have been funding a lot of microbiome research since many years. Um, and actually, I think it was uh, more than 10 years ago when this uh, hype around the microbiome came up. I think it was in 2008 when there was suddenly a nature cover page about the microbiome. And then uh, it really there was a hype around this research field. I think it was because um, the microbiome was a neglected organ before. We focused very much on genetics before and all kinds of things that directly link to the human body. But we thought that the microbiome is not so relevant and it was neglected. And then suddenly it was a new field and uh, we have put a lot of money into this to bring this research field forward. So uh, some years ago we had topics, research funding topics, uh, where the word microbiome was in the title of the topic and it was all around microbiome uh, to, yeah, just to bring the field forward. Now, in meantime, it has changed a lot and we, we don't have such topics anymore. We, we focus on the general health uh, challenges that we have, but there is still, of course, a lot of hope around the microbiome. Um, Yes, it has delivered a lot, but it's still uh, still many open questions and, and it's very difficult to address uh, research, to address the microbiome in, in, in research in the future. But we, we still have a lot of topics about this. I will come to this. First of all, I want to, how do I move? Maybe you can open, yeah. You can open in the play in the screen first. Yeah, that's one, perfect. Yeah. Should work, not yet. Uh, no. Yeah, very good, thank you. Right, okay. perfect. So, yeah, as I said, we, we funded lots of projects and what we have seen, there is a, a lot of diseases that are linked to the microbiome. So we discovered all of these projects that discovered individual links to specific diseases such as cancer or obesity or mental diseases, uh, for example, depression, autism, and all kinds of uh, inflammations. It's, it's, it's a long list of diseases that were linked to the microbiome. 
Um, it, I don't want to go further to this list, but this is of course one of the first discoveries. And what is important that the projects found links to the microbiome, or that sometimes they say associations between the microbiome and the disease. But this is not a very nice word, uh, the word links or association, it's not very strong. And it, you can see already from this word that it's still quite unclear what came first, the cancer or the, the modified microbiome? What came first, the disease or is the, is the changes in the microbiome, is it a consequence of the disease or, or uh, the mechanism, how the disease came up? This is all still quite unclear. What we have also seen is that a high diversity of microbes is, is crucial for human health. So, for example, in, in one project, they recommended that you should eat around 30 different vegetables per week. Uh, this was one proposal and they, they, they made a nice picture and, and a list where you can tick every week all the vegetables that you have eaten. But still, personally, I think it's, 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 it's a nice step forward to say that you should eat 30 different vegetables, but why is it 30, why not 40, or maybe 50 is even better for my health. This is still uh, quite unclear. And then for other people, maybe 10 vegetables per week is, is also okay. It depends also on other factors. So it's, it's very difficult to get the full picture for health. What is sure that the microbiome is in between health and nutrition. So nutrition is in, in a way modulating the microbiome and then this has also consequences for your health. We have seen very good results uh, in the area of fecal transplantation. So when the fecal microbiota from a healthy person is, is transferred into a sick person, and then you can really manage the disease or you can heal the sick person uh, when, when they get such a transplantation from a healthy person. But uh, yeah, this is, is working in meantime very efficiently. And it's a, it's a question if we want to, uh, if, you, if we want to have this more and more in future that, that sick people get uh, fecal transplantations from healthy people, it's, it's another thing that needs to be discussed. And what we have also seen quite from some projects is the, there is a link to air pollution. So we had uh, a project, for example, they were looking at systemic inflammations and they found some significant changes in, in some people. And they were wondering why do we have this significant changes in the microbiome of these people and they couldn't, they had a hard time to find the factor. And in the end, they discovered that these people were living in, in bigger cities with uh, no good air quality and, and that the people on the countryside, they didn't have uh, these uh, significant changes of the microbiome. So this, uh, this is explaining that the area is, 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 is quite difficult and research is, is not so easy. Um, yeah, I have another slide concerning the current scientific challenges. So I already said that um, the word link is, is often used or correlations is, is often used, but we really have to find the real causalities of the diseases. So I think there is still a, a, a long way to go where we have to put more efforts into microbiome research to, to show what is the mechanism, how is this really connected to human health. And at the same time, we see every year they, they find new confounders that are influencing the microbiome very much. So of course, nutrition is, is modulating the microbiome, but also drugs um, influence the microbiome. And some years ago, uh, all of these projects, they, they did not check if the people there of which they tested their microbiome, they did not check if they take medical drugs. And, and then um, they could find something, but it was maybe related to the medical drugs that they had taken. This is a classical confounder that is now 
um, taken much more into account. And the age is, of course, important. Some years ago, in in the project, they they didn't um, they didn't look at the age of patients, but now we have learned that uh, the diversity is going down with the with the increasing age, and yeah, this is a confounder that needs to be uh, on the agenda. And also genetics, of course, and lifestyle are very crucial confounders. All of these, there is many more confounders. They need to be checked at the same time. So it's not enough to only analyze the microbiome and to, to trying to find out what is crucial, what microbes do we need? Do we need these microbes or other microbes? We, we have to take into account all the confounders at the same time. And there, um, there is really some need to, to agree on which confounders are crucial. And it's also an issue for international cooperation because we like very much this international cooperation because uh, individual studies in, in one country are often very small and they look only at 300, 400 patients. But if we can bring all the studies together and if we can compare um, the microbiome data from uh, at international level, so then we could have thousands or 10,000s of patients and we can look at all the data and we could discover much more from this. But it's, it's very important. We cannot compare the data if we have not looked at the confounders at the same time. Then we have lots of data, but we cannot properly analyze them. So we have to agree on all the confounders and metadata uh, to be able to compare data at international level. But we, we strongly believe that pooling of data and pooling of resources, funding resources at international level is really necessary in this research field to, to get uh, next generation results. So yeah, there is lots of open unanswered questions. Uh, for example, we have learned that there is an extreme diversity and quantity of microbes in the human gut, but why did this develop and why is it so diverse and why do we have this huge quantity? We don't know. And also, we know a lot about the human gut and also some, some animal guts. For example, there was a lot of research on chicken, but why is the human gut so uh, different from chicken gut and what is the individual specificities? We, we have not yet compared this and we can't explain the differences and, and the diversity. And um, yeah, what is also an open question, what is a good microbiome? We know a, a big diversity is good, but it, we, we cannot measure it. We cannot clearly say, uh, we cannot give specific advice to patients what uh, they can do, uh, how to increase their diversity and how to keep their microbiome healthy. The mechanism of the, um, of the development of diseases and also of dynamic changes. You can eat other things and then your microbiome is, is changing a lot. And what is the mechanism behind this? We, we don't know. Uh, we have heard the modern Western diets are not healthy. Everybody has said this today. All of the three speakers said there was an impact and it's not good for your health. Um, but the mechanism is also unclear why this came up. And, and what is also an issue is that we want to change the behavior of people. People know that this is unhealthy, but they still uh, keep on eating these modern Western diets. So what we are planning for the future is so-called behavioral research to investigate uh, why people keep on eating unhealthy stuff, even though they know that this is not so good in their situation. So I also would like to point out that there is ongoing changes in, in science and also in policies. So I already mentioned that years ago, we, we put a lot of money in, into microbiome research, but now we think that this was silo research because we have focused very much on the silo of the microbiome. We didn't take other disciplines and other factors 
into account at the same time. But science has developed now into multidisciplinary research and to, to pool data from all kinds of discipline to get in the end the full picture of human health. It's very important to consider lifestyle, nutrition, age, drugs, everything. At the same time, only then we get clear uh, information. And the same is, is happening at political level, I would say. We, have, we, are, we are changing our working style uh, very much from individual uh, genealogies to, to co-creation. We call it co-creation because there was not so much uh, co-creation the years before the different departments of the European Commission have not been working together. And now we try to develop the great ideas together in co-creation. And we try to take better into account what the other departments think, what they believe, and what they what they believe is, is important for the future. This is some uh, changes that you can see also in other governmental organizations all around the world. Uh, there is really this trend to multidisciplinary and, and to, towards co-creation. So future funding, of course, we continue to, um, to fund microbiome research. We have in the area of health research, we have this um, motto, we say, staying healthy in a rapidly changing society. And there is big challenges ahead. So you will not see the microbiome in the title of the topics. And sometimes maybe it's more difficult to see the microbiome behind. You really have to read the full text of the topics. Uh, we have very interesting topics where, where microbiome is, is also included. When you really check the scope of what should be done, then you will see that microbiome is in under these topics. So for example, mental health topic, there was an obesity topic a topic on chronic inflammation, immunotherapies, and of course, cancer uh, with the cancer mission. This is also a priority for us to, to fund um, all kinds of uh, cancer ideas for the future, uh, to take also risky ideas on board uh, to bring cancer research forward. So uh, yeah, if you are a microbiome researcher and you want to work in these areas, you, you have to read these topics. Uh, if you, if you uh, don't find the links, uh, you have to contact me. In conclusion, I would say uh, that the microbiome is a highly valuable tool with a big potential to, to show and to influence the state of human health. So to, to diagnose and to treat diseases. There is very interesting results, but on the same time, I have to say many things are still in the dark. And anyway, we have to use this tool because it's a very potential tool and we have to exploit the potential that is behind the microbiome. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. That's uh, so absolutely a uh, clear message uh, from you. And we would like to thank you on behalf of UEG for what you told us. I think uh, it is uh, interesting to see the list of uh, the field of research. And I, and I like your combination of sciences and policies. And this is what we have. I had a question from, uh, from uh, UEG uh, scientists saying is, is uh, in this case the uh, EU supporting the research funding for this. You made it clear, uh, I believe that the microbiome in, is in the several topics and you listed at least five topics. So are you confirming that EU is very much interested in funding research for, for microbiome within uh, Europe, uh, Dirk? Yes, of course, we, we keep on funding, but uh, I was trying to explain that years, many years ago, uh, we, we put, uh, you can see the microbiome already in the title of the topic, and you, you cannot yeah. see the title of the topic because we, we have changed our working style and we try to concentrate on the big challenges such as mental health and cancer. So you find topics where mental health and cancer is in the title of the topic, but then when you keep on reading uh, the definition of the topic and the challenges and the scope, and under scope you see very often what 
the tools that should be taken into account. And here you can see that we want to uh, see analysis of the microbiome and of course other factors because it's, it's always multidisciplinary and you always, they always have to st study also the lifestyle of, of people uh, to get the, the good picture of health. So that's absolutely fine. With us as gastroenterologists, we've seen already the link with the obesity that you mentioned, uh, the link with the chronic uh, uh, chronic diseases and the chronic inflammation. There's a background of osteoarthrosis, which is means a microbiome too. Uh, you mentioned immunotherapies, and again we have uh, leading with the immunotherapies in different diseases for the gut, for the liver, and of course the cancer. It's a transversal disease. So I think that your plan is absolutely clear. And we know that that is uh, uh, also when you mentioned about the mental health, we need that for any patient that regardless the kind of organ that is involved and there are the new, the new finding about, about the involvement of, of psychology and also psychiatric disturbances. So uh, I think we thank you very much because you gave us uh, some positive uh, insights about uh, uh, you and your uh, position exactly in the, in the unit dedicated to uh, combating diseases that I think is the right the right unit for us. So uh, we will pick up your suggestion and we'll contact you from UG. So uh, thank you very much again. And if you wish to stay now, we will have uh, uh, Professor Mann's uh, uh, talk. So maybe that can be very, very uh, pleasant for uh, uh, you too. So I invite you to stay. Uh, Sarah, may I go ahead and, and, and introduce Professor Michael Mann's? Okay, thank you. So uh, Professor Michael Manns, uh, I think is uh, so well known all around in Europe, is the past president of UEG. He's also a member of the uh, scientific panel for health of the European Commission. At the present time, he is the president of uh, the Hanover School of Medicine. Uh, uh, he's a, a great colleague, he's a friend, uh, and uh, we had uh, this uh, great opportunity to co-chair together with uh, uh, Tom Carson, the ESO Lancet Commission. And Professor Manser will give us some insight about what uh, our was really the publication, then the, the recommendation from the uh, from the commission. Michael, thank you very much to find the time to stay with us. Okay, thank you very much, Patricia. Um, I have to wait a minute. Let's look at the slides. Yeah, culture, this should be fine. The first, the number one, the first one. Can you see the slides? One, perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Patricia. It's a pleasure to introduce to you the results of the ESA Lancet Liver Commission. Uh, and just as an introduction, the Lancet partners with uh, scientific societies to tackle major health issues with an emphasis on Europe, WHO Europe, and uh, there has been a partnership over the last three to four years with the European Association for the Study of the Liver to uh, analyze liver diseases throughout Europe and to make recommendations. Uh, I want to give acknowledgement, as Patricia told, Tom Carlson, Patricia Bohr, myself, we chaired it. And uh, there were several uh, vice and general secretaries of ESL involved in this. <clears throat> this is the final product. It was published. Uh, Electronical in December last year, and uh, we had an online presentation. Uh, and uh, Ursula von der Leyen gave an uh, uh, introduction, and you may see it on YouTube. And it was published in print version earlier this year. Uh, the, the publication has, I think, 50 pages and almost as much authors. And the title is Protecting the Next Generation of Europeans Against Liver Disease Complications and premature metology. There are <clears throat> successes that we have in hepatology and a role model is hepatitis C. And you can see uh, here is the example that uh, uh, hepatitis C was discovered in 1989. And since 2014, we have drugs available orally, uh, independent of genotype that can cure for the first time a chronic viral infection in men. And you see on the right side, this is a publication from Tom Carlson with Frank Tucker that over the recent years, since the introduction of all oral medication, there was a significant decline in hepatitis C. Overall, this also has an impact on liver transplants attributable to viral causes, including hepatitis C 
and hepatitis B, uh, which is significantly reducing. The costs of drugs have been very expensive for hepatitis C, but we know that it also pays off economically that we expect from the year 2032, it will be cost effective, the use of these drugs. The WHO has introduced a, a goal that by 2030, there should be a reduction uh, that 90% of cases should be diagnosed, 80% be treated, leading to a 65% reduction in mortality. That, uh, what you can see here, that uh, many of the countries are not on the track for the WHO target, among them many established countries like United States and several European countries. The multi, there has been a multidisciplinary approach uh, for this commission, including patients and nurses. There were nine working groups, disease burden and prevention, including policy, stigma from liver disease, human rights and patient's voice, primary and community care, including testing and access to care pathways, educational frameworks and care models to support new standards in tackling liver disease. And then there were five working groups uh, tackling and attacking uh, specific disease areas like fatty liver disease, viral diseases, rare diseases, and pediatric reference group, liver oncology, including liver transplantation, and decompensated liver disease, including palliative care. One of the results uh, was that, uh, to our surprise working in this commission, is that uh, working life lost is now number two, second to ischemic heart disease. And the way to look how diseases have an impact on the society is number one, overall death rate. Number two, when death occurs and when disease inability occurs. And in liver disease, it occurs in working life, it's early. On the right side, you see that two thirds of deaths occur in working age in alcohol induced liver disease. And here, this is another way to show this. The, you see in green, alcohol related liver disease and death due to diabetes and cancer uh, are occurring at a later age. Europe is very heterogeneous. You see here that there are uh, in European regions, it's rather stable in other parts of the world. You see a significant, even further significant increase in liver disease. Uh, you have discussed nutrition, you have discussed obesity, and we see in liver disease a, re a reduction in viral hepatitis uh, causing the liver transplantation. At the same time, we see an increase in end-stage liver disease due to fatty liver disease. And this graph shows you that between 1990 and 2019, a significant increase of liver cancer associated to fatty liver disease. However, uh, alcohol, fat, and viruses are major risk factors, but this is not all. Apart from that, we have he uh, hereditary metabolic liver diseases. Examples are hemochromatosis and Wilson disease. We have a whole series of autoimmune liver diseases. Uh, we have familial cholestatic syndromes, vascular diseases. But we also should think that most drugs are metabolized in the liver. And the number one reason um, for, for drugs failing, either pre- or post-approval, is hepatotoxicity. More than 1,000 drugs are potentially hepatotoxic. And nowadays, uh, acute liver failure is reducing costs by viral hepatitis, while uh, the majority is caused either in the idiopathic or drug induced. This overall led the commission to the concept that we need to shift the paradigm. We need to call for paradigm shift. At the moment, liver diseases in the, is the intention and the care of specialists, tertiary care centers and specialists. And uh, this is expensive. Treatments are now aimed at end stage liver disease and liver cancer, which is a complication of cirrhosis, and these are expensive. And the reversible early stages are often overlooked. And we have obesity, alcohol, viral hepatitis, and several of the rare diseases that can now be treated or prevented. And therefore, we need to have a shift and shift focus towards early disease stages and prevention, which would have a greater effect on liver-related mortality. Uh, this includes fight against uh, sugar in food for children. This includes uh, minimum alcohol price, 
taxation, and also the application of modern hepatitis C and hepatitis B drugs, and using vaccines, vaccines against hepatitis B and hepatitis A. In the more rare diseases, which are very expensive to treat, we need to personalize treatment. Concerning cirrhosis, there's been a particular working group chaired by Pierre Guinness on end stage on cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is very common and one of the main causes of death and disability adjusted years worldwide. Development of cirrhosis, however, takes years, many years, and the diagnosis often missed, and a paradigm shift is mostly needed to diagnose the disease early before cirrhosis develops. This is a cartoon showing on the left side the typical risk factors, and uh, fatty liver develops, and uh, it takes many, many years until there's cirrhosis and liver cancer, 10 to 30 years, and most of the years there are no symptoms. Therefore, we need non-invasive tests for fibrosis to make an early diagnosis when the disease is still reversible. That screening is effective is one example. Here are three regions of the world, Europe, China, Japan, and it means countries with different policies on screening liver cirrhosis for hepatocellular carcinoma. When you see the uh, red curve, that Japan, which has the most aggressive and most effective screening implementation, that here the survival population-wise for liver cancer is best. Europe is medium and China is worst. This reminds us to colonic cancer, where we also have early pre-malignant stages, and it takes years until end-stage cancer develops, and we have seen several interesting studies nationwide, partially, when uh, screening colonoscopy can prevent end stages, and therefore this is a similarity to liver cancer. So more than 90% of liver diseases can be prevented. However, we diagnose disease too late. We diagnose disease in end stage on the right side when uh, the specialist is taking care of these patients. Therefore, we need now to raise awareness of patients and medical personnel for liver diseases. And we have to switch the attention to the primary care physicians, which are responsible for prevention, early diagnosis, and early treatment to prevent end stages, which are the focus of the specialists. So overall, Easel Lancet Commission has 10 recommendations. One is for healthcare providers number one to five. It means implementation of standardized and simplified liver blood tests for early detection and prompt care. We have to fight for it. For example, in Germany, we have now screening for hepatitis C and hepatitis B, but not for ALT. Second, utilization of opportunities created by hepatitis B and C drugs, as well as hepatitis B and A vaccines to achieve viral hepatitis elimination in Europe. And I explained to you the WHO goals for 2030. We need to increase awareness and provide financial incentives for primary care peers and professionals. We found out that the financial incentives for primary care physicians is not in favor of liver diseases and rather in favor of cardiovascular. Number four, non-viral liver diseases must be classified along with other non-cumulative diseases to engage appropriate care models. And this is uh, transferring to the fifth recommendation, all forms and sorts of stigma towards people at risk of or with liver disease must be opposed. Relevant changes to the medical nomenclature should come first. Why calling non-alcoholic steatohepatitis alcoholic? Because this has nothing to do with alcohol. The second series of recommendations is for policymakers. Policy public disclosure of prices for antiviral drugs to our Europe would reinforce the WHO World Health Assembly resolution to improve fairness of market prices. <clears throat> Number seven, European governments must introduce uniform policies to reduce the harmful use of alcohol. Uh, we have seen very nice data by this working group how much, how significant the correlation is between minimum alcohol price and the number of deaths due to alcoholic disease in the population. Eight, a complete social and digital media ban on the marketing of alcohol and ultra-processed, high-fat and high-sugar foods targeting to children. 
Number nine, promote industry-led food reformulation and minimization of social inequities by subsidizing healthy foods. And finally, EU and European governments should prioritize the harmonization of critical forms of public health intervention and health-related policies across Europe. And really, Europe, uh, there is significant inequities throughout Europe, uh, which we have to fight against. So ladies and gentlemen, hopefully this Lancet Commission will help to become aware, to create awareness that the liver disease can be prevented. We need to shift from end stage liver diseases to early disease uh, treatment and prevention and diagnosis. So we think when we implement all these measures, the liver is, could become a window to this 21st century health of the European population. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Manz. And I think that is the summary of what has been done for nearly four years. And uh, since you had Sarah Wiener, that she's really the, 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 the ones that allow us to have this webinar. Maybe Sarah can make a comment. She, she's, she likes to, to talk in German, so you both are German speaking. So go ahead, Sarah, to, to talk to Michael. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, dear Patricia. Thank you all for your outstanding presentations and very exhaustive presentations. I have noted that we have a lot of goals in common. We have found some common answers, but a lot of questions remain open. And I think that we all realize how important the role of the microbiome is to our health, like mental, physical health, and politicians must act as well. And uh, some has been done already, some topics have been mentioned, but there is leave for more to do, and we must work pluridisciplinary, all of us, and I ask you all to work with politicians, with the EU commissions, with NGOs, with the civil society, so as to make progress, because I'm afraid that in today's situation, with highly processed um, food stuff, uh, as salvation of the world, we must act, and the situation is not getting any better, but worse. And I think we need a network of reasonable people to be part of the solution. And our uh, diversity of the microbiome needs natural food. And that also means we need a legal framework. We must define a legal framework, meaning that in the end, as consumers, we must be informed in a transparent way. Psychologically speaking, it's also important to create a healthy environment to make it easy to choose healthy food, to compensate for a healthy lifestyle, while at the same time banning unhealthy lifestyles. That's why I think we must act early in the nursing school because it's in the first years that the taste buds are being formed. And I have created a foundation that teaches cooking to children, small children, because if you don't know how to cook, you are not able to avoid certain food types. So the environment is very important, as we know from psychology. The closer the temptation of junk foods are located, the more we will consume it. And this morning I had assisted to a webinar, uh, children, children food, and it is a bad thing that we do not act consequently. And labeling is also an issue. The EU Commission wants to present a new legal framework on labeling. I think that we need a scoring system with risk scores. And at least we need also the process 
level of food. And if this is not possible, we need a campaign that states clearly there's only one thing that is healthy, i.e. cooking with natural local foodstuff. And if you want to really do it well and go all the way, you need ecological sustainable food. We need stricter rules on European level to make progress, to protect our children and to avoid such chronically infective diseases. That is a huge challenge. We need to be able to enjoy a healthy lifestyle with healthy foodstuff that are fun. That means also reducing your meat consumption and consume the right type of meat. We're not the only ones on this world. We are many in our body. And of course, we know that we have to take care of all of them to make our habits healthy. I am rather optimistic we're not alone. We can work in the network. There are a lot of surveys and studies. We have to bring them together. And I hope that, uh, as Hadrick said, we need to be able to count with different uh, service metric studies, networks. Uh, I still have some time left. And I think that we are at a paradigm shift and must make the right choice. And that's why I really hope that we will be able to promote the right thing. And as a bio uh, agriculture, as a cook, I have to stress the fact that soil also has its own biomes. And there also we have a risk of impoverishing the biome of the soil. And there also we must make efforts and must be careful. We damage our microcosm and in this respect, our macrocosm as well. And I'd like to say goodbye to all of you that uh, stayed with us till the end. And I hope that you have learned something. I hope that you can take something home and I'd like to thank uh, you, Patricia Burra, from the bottom of my heart. This is, for the time being, our last seminar. Microbiomes will remain a important subject. And I ask you all, investigators, doctors, uh, scientists, uh, consumer protectors, to work in network together with me so I can do the right thing. and. Uh, fight for our cause. Thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to a further cooperation with you and I wish you all a, a wonderful afternoon. I hope you won't die of heat. I hope you're all well. And I hope that at least tonight you will have the opportunity to enjoy some really good and healthy food. And uh, this is important for you. This is important for your family and for all the billion of people living on this planet. Just to give it to Professor Michael, uh, if you just wish to final comment regarding what Sarah told us and for the future for us as gastroenterology in this topic, in this field, with this collaboration with you. Um, Michael, what is the, 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 let's say, the wish for us, according to what Sarah said? Come back, you know, normally everybody knows what cardiology is, yeah, uh, but nobody knows what gastroenterology is. And there is liver, there's pancreas, there's stomach, large bowel, small bowel. And uh, uh, overall, I think my predecessor, uh, Michael Farthing, as president of UEG, he created the term digestive health. And I took it and I tried to promote it. I think digestive health, this comes very close to what Sarah Wiener uh, said we we need to look uh, at the food is where it all starts yeah the food the microbiome and uh, then a little bit to refer into our commission i think we we need to prevent diseases and i think nutrition is there to prevent and, uh, one is very important we need to start in childhood we need to educate a childhood and something which is very important to distribute and to note that obesity in children is maintained through adulthood at 80 percent 
So if we do not prevent obesity in children, we will not be able to fight obesity in adulthood. And this has an impact uh, far beyond the digestive tract. And uh, I think I'm not an ex, I'm not a, a biopharma, I'm not a cook, yeah? uh, but I think uh, healthy nutrition is very, very important. And we learned how important it is uh, really to fight advertisement for sugar and unhealthy food uh, for the young population. Yeah, so thank you very much. I think uh, we had a, a great discussion and I would like to thank all the speakers, uh, but a special thank to Sarah Wiener. Uh, this was the, let's say, with this uh, uh, webinar, there was the conclusion of uh, all the uh, two years uh, uh, webinars on, on Microbaum, and we want really to close with this uh, summing up of uh, different experience. And I think we succeeded on that. There are some questions about the registration uh, available uh, uh, of this meeting. And I think uh, if you don't mind, uh, Michael will can ask you the slides and uh, uh, then we'll ask uh, the office of UAG to organize to send to everyone that we like uh, to, to ask for. Uh, the recording is online so we can provide to everyone. And uh, there are two uh, from UAG, Matilde Oliver or uh, uh, Andrea Botos that you find on the website of uh, UEG and they will provide to all of you with all the registration and all the slides. So once more, thank you to the speakers, to the attendees and, and thanks uh, Sarah for looking after us. And we really hope that we continue with this uh, collaboration. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's hope ich auch and einen schönen Nachmittag. Bye bye. See you bye soon. Bye. Yes, I'm here and I wish you all a good Thank afternoon. Goodbye. Bye bye. See you soon. Bye bye.